So happy to welcome all of you here. I'm so glad to see you all, friends and new friends, and um, just grateful that you could be here. Hello to those of you who are on the internet, so please excuse this one personal announcement. Jordan, my three-year-old grandson, if you're watching, Meme loves you. <laughs> they had to go to soccer practice tonight. My daughter-in-law said, well, maybe we can watch it on the soccer field, so we'll see. She said, he'll want to watch his Meme. So I have a disclaimer. I'm going to start off with a disclaimer, and that is, Everything we talk about tonight is so complex. Fear is complex. Our responses to it are complex. The spiritual guidelines that we're going to talk about later on are also complex. So what we're really doing is sort of skimming the surface so that hopefully if you find something of interest, you'll have an opportunity to go into it a little bit more deeply. And for those of you who are who've come possibly to say, what do you mean live without fear? We need fear. Healthy fear is helpful. I won't forget that. So let's talk a little bit about living with fear. Um, before we can live without it, it's helpful to understand it. So in order to understand it, we need to ask ourselves some questions, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, in order to change something, that is, to live without fear, we have to be aware of what we're going to change. And in order to be aware of it, we have to look inside. And that's where we're going. Then we're going to talk about some specific steps to learning to live without fear. And we're also going to talk about some spiritual concepts or some guidelines that will help to facilitate that process. And, of course, some quotes, just to keep us going. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man, or woman, is not he or she who does not feel afraid, but he or she who conquers that fear. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's talk about fear. What is it? Well, it's an innate response to danger. Um, it is rooted in our evolutionary process. Um, we needed it to survive. It protected us from lethal dangers back in the days when we were running away from dinosaurs or um, didn't know that bad weather was coming or um, there was a, an aggressive tribe who lived over the hill who wanted something that we had. It was an innate response to that so that we could survive. Today, while we may face fewer lethal dangers on a daily basis, um, we still have that fear response. And truly, we really need it. When the body perceives, or when the brain perce perceives that there is danger, the message goes to the amygdala. It's a little part of our brain, part of the limbic system, and what it does in a very layman's description, is that it floods the body with stress hormones. And those stress hormones are the ones that allow us to respond. So again, while there are not as many lethal dangers today, there are still dangers. And so this happens, this physical response happens when we're walking through a parking lot and a car starts to back up and doesn't see us there. It gives us that opportunity to jump out of the way, even when we're tired and thinking, I am never going to make it back to my car. <clears throat> they start to back out, and boy, we get some energy then, don't we? Or when a toddler heads for a hot stove or a busy street, it gives us the energy to quickly catch that toddler and to keep them safe. So we still have those responses, and we still need them. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little while. What do you think people fear? And this is, this is an open question. What do you think people are afraid of? Anybody want to share an answer? The unknown. The unknown. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Anything else? Financial problems? Failure. Failure. Spiders. Spiders. <laughs> yes. Yes. Getting hurt. 
getting hurt. Emotionally or physically. Emotionally or physically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Success. Oh, yes. <laughs> because if we have success, we may still fail. Or what if we fail trying to find the success? Absolutely. Death. Death. Yes. Death. We've covered a lot. I'm, I'm afraid of snakes. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in South Louisiana, and there are poisonous snakes. And so I am afraid of snakes. My first summer here, as I'm working in the garden and pulling weeds, I thought, I better check. And I asked someone, are, do you do y'all have snakes here? They looked at me like I'd lost my mind. I said, no, you can clear your garden safely. There are no snakes under those bushes. Because I put my hands in places under bushes that in Louisiana I would never do. <laughs> Scared of snakes. All right. So let's look at some fears. Snakes. <laughs> Public speaking, heights, small spaces, okay, going all the way down to the dark, which is kind of like the unknown. 1998. And these are the percentages from 1998, which was a little over 20 years ago, which I find very hard to believe. Um, so these were the things that people were afraid of in 1998. And in 2001, it was still about the same, although the percentages changed just a little bit. This is from a Gallup poll. Mark Twain. Courage is the resistance to fear and the mastery of fear, not the absence of fear. I thought we needed something beautiful to look at with all this talk of fear. You know, things change, nature changes, the flowers bloom. I just, you know, all this discussion of fear, I just thought I needed something else here. So, the Ch uh, Chapman University does a survey of American fears. They've done this for the last several years. And so, in 2015, the top five fears, government corruption, cyber terrorism, corporate tracking of personal data, Terrorist attack, government tracking of personal data. Interesting. We didn't mention any of those things really before, did we? 2018, the top five fears. Corrupt government officials. About the same thing, but look at the difference in percentage. 74% of the people were fearful about corrupt government officials. Pollution, pollution of drinking water. And again, these numbers are still higher than the highest number in 2015. Not having enough money for the future, which was mentioned before. And again, it's just about on par with the highest fear in 2015. It surprised me a little bit. I really expected to see more of snakes, public speaking, claustrophobia. Um, this tells a little bit about us, doesn't it? One of the things that, that I pulled from it, I don't know if, that's a, if it's accurate or not, but what I pulled from it is that while these things still impact us as human beings, we also are fearful about things that impact the world as a whole and what will impact future generations. But then I started to think, maybe I'm looking at apples and oranges here. Because Chapman started their study in 2014. The Gallup poll was a whole different poll. I don't know if they were polling the same things. So I thought, maybe I should just check. Maybe they didn't ask people in the Chapman survey um, if they were afraid of snakes. They did. Whoops, sorry. I forgot the last one. I apologize. People I love becoming seriously ill, which goes to that death and illness, yeah. So I compared them, I went back and I looked and I found out that in 2018 they, they did with the Chapman survey, asked the same things. Now what I found quite interesting is that in 2001, 
not quite 20 years ago, 51% of us were afraid of snakes. Less than half of that, less than half of us are afraid of snakes today, at least the kind we find crawling in our gardens. We may be afraid of snakes crawling around in government offices, but that's another story. Um, so these are the things that we fear. Now, a couple of things I found interesting. In 2001, dying was not on the list. But in 2018, almost 28% of us are afraid of dying. Zombies were not on the list in 2001. <laughs> However, almost 8.5% of us are afraid of zombies now. That frightens me. <laughs> <laughs> it could, it could, okay, yeah. All right, so anyway, but it did. So it wasn't comparing apples and oranges. Our changes have just, our fears have just changed over that 20-year time frame. A Thich Nhat Hun quote. Someone asked me, aren't you worried about the state of the world? I allowed myself to breathe, and then I said, what is most important is not to allow your anxiety about what happens in the world to fill your heart. If your heart is filled with anxiety, you will get sick, and you will not be able to help. How profound. How very profound. And so that leads us to the question, whoops, sorry, of... How does fear impact us physically? Well, earlier we said that fear is useful and valuable, and it is, as long as we're not constantly afraid. The body is hardwired to react to danger, and the body is going to do what it is supposed to do. So when the body perceives danger, it reacts accordingly. The amygdala sends out those stress hormones to the body, which is helpful when we're about to get backed over by a car in a parking lot. But it's not helpful when we are constantly being frightened by things. So <clears throat> our body actually perceives that many of the stressors that we face on a daily basis, our body perceives those stressors as danger. Stressor stressors such as not having enough money. Stressors such as working at a job that maybe we don't really like, not having enough time for family or friends, or just to sit down and breathe for a little while, or relationship issues. But the body perceives these stressors as danger, because they really are kind of dangerous to us, aren't they? And so the body then, the amygdala, releases those stress hormones. And the continual release of those stress hormones can cause these problems. Okay? Anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain, memory and concentration impairment, I thought I was having some of these because I was getting older. Now I'm beginning to wonder what it really is. How does it impact us psychologically? Well, fear is uncomfortable. None of us like feeling fearful. It's a vulnerable feeling. Feelings are just feelings. That's what they are. We all have them. Um, but fear makes us feel vulnerable. It makes us want to hide under the bed or hide in the closet just to avoid it. We don't want to be fearful. So as human beings, psychologically, we react in several different ways. One is that we cover our fear with anger. Because anger is a powerful emotion. When we're angry, we can get up and defend ourselves, as opposed to when we're fearful and we're hiding under the bed. Okay, curled up in the fetal position. Best example that I can think of. Um, 
teenager comes home late past their curfew. The parent's been sitting there waiting all this time, worried to death, fearful that something terrible has happened to their child, because that's what parents do, right? They go from zero to 100. Instead of saying, my kid is just out having fun and forgot what time it is, to my kid is whatever on the side of the road. Okay, that's what we do. Kid walks in 30 minutes after their curfew. The parent who is really, truly fearful reacts angrily. Where have you been? Why are you late? You're so irresponsible. That anger comes out because we've covered the fear with the anger. Another example, driving down the highway, somebody cuts you off and almost causes you to have an accident in the car. Frightening, hearts racing, right, shaking. But we don't say, oh gosh, that scared me. We say, that stupid idiot, sorry, I try not to use those words, but you know, they fit here. And we get angry at that person who's cut us off. Again, anger covering the fear. Another way we deal with our anger is through control, or at least the attempt at control. We, we feel like, or somewhere we, along the line, we got the message that if we can control people, the people that we love, we can control situations, we can keep them safe. Isn't that wonderful? What a good laugh. When I was in my early 20s and I moved away from home, across the country away from home, I had, I had this anxiety because I believed that if I lived at home, not in the same house, mind you, but in the same town, in the same area, that nobody in my family would die. Really? That's crazy, y'all. But that's what I thought, that my presence there could control that. Had a client once quite a few years ago, mom came to me and she said, will you see my teenage daughter? She is out of control. She needs some help. Out of control. Sure. So she brings her teenage daughter in to see me, meet with the daughter several times. Daughter's a teenager and teenagers, you know, they've got issues. They're, you know, working through things. But this was a young lady who didn't look out of control to me. I mean, I've seen some out of control teenagers and she was not one. And so in the course of our conversations, she said, you know, it's my mom you really need to see. She's crazy. (laughs) And I said, what do you mean? She said, she tries to control me all the time. And when I don't do what she wants me to do, she loses it. She just loses it and she screams and she yells and she gets so angry. Okay. So after a few sessions, I called the mom in and we were talking. And in the course of our conversation, it became very clear that because of some of the experiences that the mother had had in her childhood, she had gotten the idea that she could protect her daughter if she controlled her. Well, you know what happens, right? When we try to control somebody else, they go, oh, no, you're not controlling me. And then the mom got scared because she didn't have any control. So she held on tighter, which made the teenager push harder. And the mom tried to control, well, you get the idea. A vicious cycle that was going nowhere and was doing no one any good. And it was all due to the mom wanting to protect her daughter. Very reasonably so. Another way we deal with anger is to avoid situations that we perceive might be risky or dangerous. Um, We might not look for another job um, because we are uncomfortable with having to go into a new situation or we're fearful about meeting new people in a new work environment. We might avoid relationships because we don't want to have our hearts broken again. We may avoid pursuing something that we really would like to do. Um, I started to make up a story, but then I realized that my own story works. I went back to school in my um, late 40s to get my doctorate. And I was sitting, and and I was was so fearful before I went. Um, Not, let me just say, not that I've conquered my fears. 
This particular one I did manage to get over. But I'm, all I could think of is, I'm going to be sitting in a classroom with a bunch of 20-somethings. My brain doesn't work like it did when I was 20. What if I fail? What if, what if I can't do this? What if they think I'm stupid? Look at that old lady sitting over there. I mean, you know, really. Didn't happen, although I was a little shocked when one of the young women in the class indicated that she was born the same year that I graduated from high school. It wasn't pretty. But, but, again, we avoid doing those things sometimes because we're afraid of how we may appear to others. What if I fail? What if I succeed and then fail? What if, what if? And you ask, what if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? I found it interesting when I was doing research for this that um, there are some studies that show that in areas where life is most difficult, um, religion is strongest. But when life starts to improve, involvement with religion declines. One specific study noted that during a recession, um, religious institutions prosper, as does the sale of alcohol. (laughs) And it made me start to wonder why, when things are difficult, why do we go towards maybe a religious institution or some organization or something that, like that. Maybe, maybe it's because fear is about our personality and our personalities are looking for answers or maybe to escape. So then where does the fear come from? We know it's based on survival. But it also originates in our mind, from our thoughts, our perceptions, our beliefs, from our attachments. Again, another story. I'll have no secrets by the time I'm, there's a new president here. Um, when I was a little girl growing up, my mother was terrified of the dentist. Because I, I think, really, because in the small town we lived in, there was no dentist, and it was the doctor who did the dental stuff, which was only a step above the barber. I don't, you know, anyway. So, um, but she was terrified of going to the dentist. Well, as a little kid, I think, I picked up on that. You know, if your parent is really scared of something, that must mean it's very scary and very, very dangerous. So I interpreted dentists and dental offices are very dangerous and are to be avoided at all costs at all costs. Not true, but that was the belief that I got. And the belief that I carry with me to this day. I have to go through what I feel are extraordinary efforts to be comfortable when I go to the dentist for even the slightest thing. For big things, oh my gosh, not even going there with you. Then I definitely won't have any secrets left. Another example, a friend of mine, um, she was growing up. Every time she started to walk out of the door, her mother would ask her questions about her dress and the way she looked. And they weren't necessarily very nice questions. Her mother would say things like, you're going out like that? You're wearing that? You don't have any makeup on. What if you see somebody you know? Continuously. Continuously. As a teenager, to this day, this woman who is about my age, okay, which is not 12, um, she will not leave her house without full makeup on and without being dressed to the nines. Okay. Not even in an emergency, because I've seen her in emergency situations. I'm like, how do you look like this? How do you look like this? I show up for these emergencies in my sweatpants. Well, I can't, I mean, you know, I have to. I don't think she even realized too much where it was coming from. So our perceptions, our beliefs, 
our attachments to our families, to the things that we love, to our ideas. How angry do people get when their ideas are attacked? All you have to do is look on Facebook for five minutes and you'll see that. Another Thich Nhat Hanh quote. Fear keeps us focused on the past or worried about the future. If we can acknowledge our fear, we can realize that right now we are okay. Right now, today, we are still alive and our bodies are working marvelously, or at least close to it. Our eyes can still see the beautiful sky. Our ears can still hear the voices of our loved ones. Maybe not as good as they would have a few years ago, but we're here. Now, I do want to say again, some fear is good. If I'm going on a walk and a dog comes running at me, barking ferociously with his teeth bared, I need to be afraid, right? I need to be afraid. That's appropriate. If I go to a gathering and I meet someone who just maybe makes me feel uncomfortable, maybe what I need to do is to kind of remember that, think about it, process it. I'm a firm believer in listening to our gut, or more politely spoken, our intuition, our intuition. Fear is intensely personal. What we are afraid of deep down is probably not something we're going to admit to other people. Um, It is communicated to us in any number of ways, especially covertly. We just, it's not an overt. It's not like you should be afraid of snakes. You should be afraid of getting your heart broken. You should be afraid of whatever. It just happens. And then because we don't want to look at it, we don't want to deal with it, we shove it down into our subconscious as far as we can get. So we have to look at ourselves, which in my opinion is one of the hardest things in the world to do, to objectively look at ourselves. Marie Curie, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. If we understand what we are afraid of, we are less likely to fear it. So we have to begin by looking within, because that's really where the answers are. And so we can be that like this cute little kitten, sweet little kitten who looks inside and sees himself as he really is. <laughs> That's who he really is. The answers are always inside of us. We look outside to find the answers, you know? How do I live without fear? How do I change the way I perceive things so I'm not fearful? Looking outside is not going to help. We have to look inside. A quote from Rumi. Last week we had a wonderful speaker, Poria Montezeri, and this is one of the things that he shared. I have lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons. Don't we always want to know the answers and the reasons? Knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. We are inside with the answers. They're not outside. There is no outside. Okay, y'all are tired. Are y'all tired of me being, you know, all this philo- philosophical stuff? Let's get down to brass tacks and do the, the realities. Okay, let's talk about learning how to live without fear. I think all of that other information is important. I wouldn't have included it. I didn't add it just so that you would have something else to sit here and listen to. Um, But I think it builds up 
to how we actually, as human beings, learn, start to learn to live without fear. It's a process, y'all. This does not happen overnight. We have to work on it and work on it and work on it. Because that's the only way we change things. We have to be aware of it. We have to decide what we want to change, and then we work to change it. So we identify the fear. What am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? Well, from South Louisiana, being afraid of snakes, that's cool. But there are other things that I might be afraid of that I haven't shared with you. So we identify the fear. If we don't know right up front, right up to, oh, yes, I'm afraid of this, because a lot of times we don't because it's shoved so deep inside of ourselves, then what we do is we start to look at our behaviors and our thoughts that are not really working for us anymore. They're just, just not working. And that may indicate that there's something there. So we follow it backwards. Okay. Why do, um, did I write it up there? Yeah. No, I didn't write it up there. I wrote it down here. So, um, why, asking questions like, why do I avoid? Why do I avoid going to parties where I don't know anybody? Why do, I feel uncomfortable when I walk into a room where I really don't know anybody. What is that about? And so I trace that back. Is it about being sort of isolated and alone? Is it because I feel like people are looking at me and maybe judging me? Is it because I feel out of place and maybe they'll think I'm funny looking or I'm dumb or I don't fit in or... Anyway, you get the idea. So tracing it back until finally we can identify what that fear is. And I can promise you that it's probably a fear that's very deeply rooted and really has nothing to do with out there but has to do with ourselves. Once we sort of identify that fear, okay, then we look at the behaviors and thoughts that support that fear. Well, I don't really need to go to that big party where I don't know anybody because I'll just be out of place and they don't need anybody there. And I mean, they don't really, they just invited me to be polite, so really it's okay if I don't go. We can rationalize it. Um, Anyway, you get the idea. So to identify what thoughts um, and behaviors support that fear because we have to know what we're going to change again to change it. Then determine if that fear is rational. Is it rational? Is this something I really do need to be afraid of? Snakes in South Louisiana? Yes. Okay. Walking into a party where I don't know anybody? No, that's not very rational. Being afraid of going to the dentist? Not very rational. Because the dentist is there to help me. Okay. Well, I think, anyway, (laughs) most of the time. Um, so, So... Is it something I should really be afraid of? Now, this is going to sound a little uh, what I call white pajama-ish. You know, the people you've seen in this, probably more in the 70s, so I'm really going to date myself. You know, the two people dressed all in white running through the fields in slow motion towards one another. Okay, that's the white pajama effect, I think. of. Um, So this sounds white pajama-ish to me, but um, make friends with the fear. Face it. Face it. Become one with your fear. All right. Um, Embrace it. It's really there just to protect you, to protect me. That's why we have fear. It's here to protect us. It's like meeting somebody from a totally different culture that we never even knew existed before. They dress differently. They look different. They talk differently. They have different customs. They eat different foods. They, you know, everything is different. And we look at them and we sort of feel a little fearful, kind of that fear of the unknown. And we may see some of this happening in our world today, right? But when we actually make friends with this person, then we realize there's nothing to be afraid of there because we're friends, and it's okay, it's safe. And then make a plan to take steps. If that fear, well, when 
that fear rises again and put the plan into action with your thoughts and behaviors. So to make this a little bit more specific, let me talk about, let me give you an example. What about a fear of growing older with no one to care for you? Um, some people don't really have families around and, and they worry, you know, as they get older, who's going to take care of me? Probably there are a lot of people with families who aren't going to take care of their loved one anyway, so they're in the same shape. Um, but I think it's not an uncommon fear as our society starts to age. Who's going to take care of me when I get older, okay, when I can't take care of myself? So we identify the fear. Or maybe we don't know that's what the fear is. So we look at our behaviors, and maybe I, I start... You know, I, I'm cranky when it's my birthday. I don't want to celebrate my birthdays anymore. I'm done with them. I don't want to talk about getting older. I just avoid all of that totally. And so I follow it back and find that I'm afraid of dying alone. Okay. Afraid of dying alone. Is that a rational fear? Well, we're all going to die. So being afraid of dying, while it's understandable, is not necessarily rational because it's going to happen. Dying alone is going to happen too. To the best of my knowledge, nobody goes with you when you die. Um, there may be situations. We're not going to talk about those. But um, typically, when we go, we go alone. But it's that journey to that end point when we get to transition of doing that alone. That's frightening. That's frightening. So that is sort of a rational fear. Make friends with it. Make friends with it. Yeah, I'm afraid of getting older and not having anyone there to care for me. Actually, I personally am not. I've identified which of my children is going to take care of me. <laughs> Don't know if you're watching, son. Um, but <clears throat> at least I know who's picking out my nursing home. That's, it's okay. He'll pick out a good one. He'll be, you know, obsessive about it. I may never see him again, but that'll be okay. Um, but, okay, make friends with that fear because it's there. And it's probably going to happen because I'm going to get older. We're all going to get older, okay? And then make a plan. Make a plan. So my plan is that, actually, I prefer to choose my own nursing home, um, but if there's really no one around that I think is going to be able to take care of me, now, while I can, I'm going to go out and find a place, actively search out a place where I know that I will be able to go and someone will take care of me in a time when I can no longer do it for myself. And I'm going to put my affairs in order. I, it amazes me how few people actually prepare for their own death. We prepare for lots of things, but we don't prepare for our own deaths. We don't put our papers together. We don't make plans. No. And then I'm going to do some self-talk. I have been able to take care of myself for this many years. I am a capable woman. I'm a competent woman. I made these plans. I can take care of myself. And I can make sure that I go to a place where someone is taking care of me when I no longer can. So that's what I do when that fear arises. And I realize that when that fear comes up for me, it has me focused on what might happen tomorrow or in tomorrow, 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 and I'm no longer living my life today and enjoying what I can. And how essential is that? When we fear tomorrow, we don't live today. So while these steps seem very simple, it sounds like, oh, Barbara said, just do one, two, three. Identify the fear, make friends with it, make sure it's rational, and then make a plan always about making a plan. Even when we're talking about, you know, pollution and fear of polluting our drinking water, there's a plan there. We need to get out and work to change the pollution. We need to get out and change that. But 
we need to do these other steps inside of ourselves so that we are not constantly living with this fear and the million other fears that surround us. As I said before, it's a process. It takes time. So when the fears come back up, remind ourselves of the plan, the steps that we've taken, and we use positive self-talk to bring ourselves back to today. This is today. And today, I am so happy to be here. But there's so much more than the practical steps. So, so, so much more. We are looking for the answers to living without fear, aren't we? We're looking for those steps. And we certainly need to work with the fears of the personality because that's our temporary abode. That's where we're living right now. But there's more. Again, I'm going back to the um, talk last week um, to Poria Montessori, and he was talking about Shams of Tabriz, who was the spiritual teacher of Rumi. And Shams and Poria related a story that we are like fish swimming in water. That's why the fish. Swimming in water, searching for water. We are like fish swimming in water, searching for water. What we are searching for is all around us. We are surrounded by it. It is nurturing us, feeding us, supporting us. It is right here. And yet we keep searching. kind of reminds me of what Glinda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz said to Dorothy. You've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. We have the power to live without fear. Okay. We have the power to do it physically, okay, through the steps. But there are other ways to live without fear as well. We have the power to face our fears, to make the changes, and to go to that place within where we will find safety and security and love. We all know the quote by Teilhard de Chardin, we are not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. When we look outside of ourselves for the answers to living without fear, we are searching this temporary world for temporary answers. When we search within, when we allow our true selves, whatever you call it, soul, higher self, whatever, doesn't matter what its name is, When we allow that part of us to, when we listen to that part of us and we find the answers there, when we touch that, that's when we find the peace, the security, the safety, and the love that we've been looking for. We find the answers because that's who we truly are. Not, Not this, but that. We become the fish who have found the water, and we become Dorothy who's clicked her heels in order to go home. So I have a question for you. Do you think our souls experience fear? It's kind of a silly question, isn't it? Because the answer is, well, of course not. What would souls have to fear? Well, if we are the souls wearing this body, wearing those bodies, what do we really have to fear? What do we really have to fear? We are all connected. One true essence. We are all connected in the essence of life, the 
essence. Let me look at this and get the right words. Our true essence is the essence of the one reality, no matter what we call it, whether we call it God or Parabrahm or the Absolute, that one reality, we are the essence of that. Therefore, we can never be alone. We are always safe. We are always secure. And we are always surrounded by love. We just forget it and get caught up in this personality that's afraid of snakes. Because my soul's not afraid of snakes. Pretty sure of that. When we look at our fears from a different field of consciousness, okay, when we rec- whatever it is we fear, we can stay in the personality and look at it and we can fear it. But if we can bring ourselves to another field of consciousness, if we can look through the eyes of the soul, then we realize there's nothing to fear. We know, as spiritual seekers, or we believe, internally I feel like I know, that there is an order and a plan to the universe. Things don't happen chaotically. Things don't happen by chance. There is a plan and an order. Life is a spiritual journey, a spiritual evolution of the soul. Our soul is evolving in this journey. It's emanations of that one reality into seemingly separate individuals having experiences. We are growing and learning. That is what we're taught on the spiritual path. We recognize that this life is only one of many. And it lasts but a blink, but a blink of an eye in terms of eternity. It's nothing. It's, not, it's very important while we're here. But if we look at it from a different field of consciousness, it goes by so quickly. It's an opportunity to learn and to grow, to enhance our spiritual evolution, So it's possible that instead of sort of focusing on our fears, we can ask ourselves, what can I learn from facing my fear? And it helped me on this spiritual evolution. How will I grow by facing my fear? How will that help this evolution of who I truly, truly am? Our heads may know this, but it's our hearts, and that's the hard work. Our heads grasp this, but we need to spend time working on it so that our hearts understand it, so that we have full congruency and we can stay there. And that's part of our evolutionary path. I'm sure there are people who have done that. I'm quite sure that all of us are working to do that. And we'll get there. That's the best part. We'll get there eventually. Khalil Gibran, march on. Do not tarry. To go forward is to move toward perfection. March on. And fear not the thorns or the sharp stones on life's path. I'm curious, Barbara, if you think that fear is cultural, meaning in areas or countries that are more developed, spiritually developed, is there less fear, or do you think there's a correlation? Of course, I don't know the answer to your question, 
Um, I don't really know the answers to any questions, um, but I certainly have an opinion because I have lots of those, um, like most of us. My perception would be that because fear is primarily of the personality, um, that wherever the personality lives and whatever culture it lives, there are fears that are there um, and inherently there. They may not be, the fears here in the United States um, may not be the fears in uh, the eastern part of the world or the Middle Eastern part or, or Africa or wherever. I think that they're all different, but I think everybody has fears. I think that's part of this human progression, human opportunity. I say that in quotes because I'm not always appreciative of the opportunity, even though I probably should be, but. I read something recently that said Buddhist countries have far less violent crime than Christian countries, which makes me think that there's probably less fear in Buddhist countries. That may cultures. be. Yeah, that may be. I don't know. I would, I would assume that, um, that individuals have the fear, whether it's whole, holistic or not. It has been said that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So how do we go about determining whether we are being foolish when dealing with a seemingly dangerous situation? Ooh, such a good question. <laughs> and I tell you, I have walked into some, some situations where probably I was a fool um, and came out of them, fortunately, very luckily. I came out of them... Um, whole, fortunately. Um, I'm thinking specifically of when I was a high school teacher and I was on duty, you know, in the commons area where all the high school kids were, and two great big guys got into a fight, but I knew them both. I mean, I taught both of them, and so I ran up between them, and I'm like, guys, stop it! And then I look up and think, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Fortunately, they were not so angry that they didn't realize that I was there, so they both backed down. Um, again, where angels fear to tread. Um, I think it's it's a personal it's a personal answer. Um, what may feel fearful for some people may not be fearful for others. Um, I've worked in a number of, of mental health situations um, where people were very angry, where they. Um, you know, the police weren't real excited about going in to talk to this person. But I'm like, no, I'm good with this. I, mean, I can, I can de-escalate this. But somebody else might not be able to go in and do that. I keep looking at the camera because the question came from the computer. But I guess, so my answer is, the short answer is, I think it's everybody has their own, has to listen to themselves. And if it turns out poorly, well, a lesson is learned still, right? Maybe not a great lesson, but a lesson is learned. Hi there. Uh, my question is like uh, in one of your uh, style, I just, uh, your fear is worrying about your past and also worrying about the future. So how do we, I know one of the term you used is for journaling and then like facing your fears, but what are the other, uh, what are the ways that you actually stay in the moment or stay in the present so that you don't worry about your past or future is, is my, it might be a big, uh, 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 could be one more session, but I'm just like in turn auto. It could be lifetimes. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, that's, um, that is the question, right? How do we live in this moment? And um, if I had the answer to that, I would make a fortune for the Theosophical Society. I mean, we'd have a much bigger room or something. I don't know. But um, my own personal perspective on that, which is all I can really share with you, because I don't know what that answer is, is that when I feel myself being pulled forward, when I feel myself being pulled backward, I try to pay attention. I try to be observant and self-observant and realize that I'm being pulled one way or the other so that I can then recenter myself. And so I can recenter myself for a few seconds before off I go again, because that's almost like the human temperament, right? But the more I bring myself back to here, it's, again, it's like changing a habit, changing a way of thinking, changing a way of behaving. Then hopefully 
in some future incarnation, I'll be able to stay in the present most of the time. So I know that you mentioned that we all die alone, but if we're all one, do we not die alone? Really? That's the paradox, isn't it? That's the paradox. And, and spirituality is filled with paradoxes. Um, so existentially, an existentialist perceive that we are alone. You know, we live alone, we die alone. And I can see that. It feels that way, doesn't it? We, we live alone, we die alone. Nobody really knows what's in our head. Um, nobody, re- nobody really knows how we feel, what we're thinking, who we really are. And so in that way, we are alone. But that's the illusion that we live in and the paradox that we seem to be alone, we feel alone, and yet we're never alone. Yeah. It's so beautiful. If I could stay in that place, you know, we're never alone. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, do you make any distinctions between fear of physical harm and psychological fears? Ooh. Well, they are different. Um, I think that they are different. I think they're still both based in the personality. Um, you know, I, physically I'm afraid of snakes. Psychologically I may be afraid of whatever, um, being alone which is kind of physical, but not really, you know. So, but they're still from the personality. They're not, one's not any better than the other. Fear is fear. And when we constantly have fear or stressors, fear that turns into stressors by continually hearing the television and what terrible things are going on in the world, whatever, then they impact us. Fear um, is also... Uh, emotion. It is? Yes, fear is an emotion. Fear is an emotion. And, you know, we all have emotions. We all have all kinds of emotions. And emotions are good. We have a tendency to say that fear is a bad emotion. It's not. It's there to protect us. You know, it's fear is just fear. But we need to know what continued fear will do for us. And that it's really of the personality. Because... um how affect our body, no? The emotion. Yeah. It can, you know, high stress or paralyze or depend what it is. So that's what I'm thinking about emotions. Yeah. Yes. It, it really can. Um, that continued stress absolutely impacts the body. It impacts the physical body. Is anger or control always a reaction to fear of some type? Is anything and always? That's my question. I don't think, I think there are very few things that are always. Um, but I think very frequently, psychologically, um, we, anger is a response to feeling vulnerable in some way, shape, or form. Um, if I have a client who comes in who's very angry, and we'll work with that anger, but really ultimately what we need to get to is what's underneath it, what's causing that anger underneath. Control. Um, I, again, I think that a lot of times control is about wanting to keep people safe or ourselves safe. So, but nothing is always, I don't, I don't think, in this temporary world. I'm a little bit fearful asking this question <laughs> because I haven't parsed it out in my head yet. But I guess what's right now, I'm trying to figure out, back to the word rational, Mm. Is it a rational fear? Or are you rationalizing? Good point. Because I think about things I've done. Last year I walked the Camino and everybody thought I was nuts. <laughs> because look at me. Um, but I'm a, when we went to Venice, I was afraid of getting on a gondola because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to walk on the pier. What if the boat tipped over? Blah, blah, blah. And I thought like it would be awkward. I mean, so I don't know, like at what point is it rational? Like you can't mm-hmm. swim, Joan. Not that a gondola will tip over, but a kayak. When my girlfriends say, let's go kayaking, that could tip over. Mm -hmm. I may or may not get in or out of the kayak, Mm -hmm. all these things. So when do I rationalize and when is it rational? Yeah. And that's a really good question um, for which I have no answer. Um, Because I think it's personal. It becomes very personal. If you can't swim, 
maybe that's pretty rational not to get into a boat that's going to, potentially going to turn over, you know, and who's going to be there to pull you out of the water. Um, but if you can swim and, you know, you want to see it and it's beautiful and your concern is just, oh, people might think I look funny getting into the boat, that may not be rational. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's kind of my take on it, but. It's something that uh, I am, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, is to be, is to learn how to, uh, to view it, attachment to emotions. Because emotions are present. It's not only negative. Mm-hmm. Emotions are, are, are important, but it's to get beyond the emotions or try to figure it out. What is it that? Okay. So I'm not a fan of, of, at this point in time, Okay. At this point in time, who knows what it'll be like in, you know, 15, 20 years. But right now, I am not a fan of trying to get beyond the emotions. I am a, a fa- we have emotions. We're human beings. And as human beings, we have emotions. Learning to work with the emotion, learning to accept the emotion, um, allowing the emotion. That's the whole thing about becoming friends with the fear is allowing it. You know, I, to allow anger not to allow our anger in such a way so that we're going to reach out and hurt someone else or something or ourselves. Okay? Anger is a valuable emotion. Fear is a valuable emotion. So is happiness. So is joy. So is love. So is every fear that we have. They just are. And so we just allow them as long as we don't take actions that are harmful to ourselves or to others. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's the cut for me. Um, because we're here to learn from those emotions. Otherwise, why would we have them? That, from my perspective, that's why we have them. Because they do present such a challenge for all of us as we go through life. How am I going to deal with this anger? How am I going to deal with this sadness? How am I going to deal with this grief? We don't seem to have a problem dealing with the happiness, do we? And the joy. But, again, they're here for us to learn from and to grow from. But I don't think, I think too often on the spiritual path, we have this perception that we have to take our emotions and get rid of them, that they're not any good. Well, I think, I think the thing is to, I think your description of the gondola or the kayak is beautiful. To be in the kayak, to feel the feelings, but not let it push us over knock us over to one side or the other, but to stay steady and balanced while we're experiencing the feeling. At least that's where I am now. In, you know, a few years, ask me again, there may be a whole different answer, which is a good thing, right? We keep learning, we keep growing and changing. Um, For the many of us who have perhaps been conditioned um, throughout life to that fear is a negative Mm -hmm. emotion um, and that even if you feel it, you certainly shouldn't express it, you know, what might people think? And so the default often does become anger or whatever it becomes for that person. As you say, it's very individual. What would your advice be for the individual who can't even recognize, isn't at the point of recognizing that they're afraid, but is right at the point of still just recognizing a lot of anger about something. And you know, again, um, it, it's so interesting because we're all on our, we're all here together, we're separate and together, that's the paradox. We're all on our own journey, and yet we're all on the same journey. Um, some people, I think, um, we're all in different places on our journey, I think of, um, when I think of the spiritual journey, I think of a, a path up a mountain that um, has switchbacks, or walking in the labyrinth where you think you're getting close to the center, and the next thing you know, you're back out to the outside. We never know where someone is on their journey. So I think that when someone is at a place in their journey, when that discomfort the discomfort with the feelings, like I don't want this anger or this fear to overwhelm me so that I can't do whatever. That's when they're willing to start the hard work, which is looking at the fear or whatever it is, looking at it, identifying it, um, and start to make plans to change it. 
and then to work to change it because it's hard work to do it. But to try to ask somebody to do that before they're at a place where they see it and they're ready, I think it's probably not likely to happen. Although I do, I will say that um, if you have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, I, I would encourage you to, um, ha- because I, most of my work was with children, which I really loved. And so one of the things is that kids don't have a very good fe- um, feeling vocabulary. So to expand their feeling vocabulary, they typically will do happy, sad, mad, and scared. Okay. So to start expanding that so that they have more words to use. And when, uh, well, two-year-olds don't count because they're two-year-olds. But if you have like a five-year-old who's, who's angry, you know, gets really angry about something, just to validate that and to name it, you're really angry right now. You're really angry because you want that lollipop and you can't have the lollipop. I'm wondering what you can have instead. But so you're validating the anger, so it's not a bad thing, okay? But, and you're redirecting, but you're also, um, you can also at that point, if that five-year-old starts to, you know, do what five-year-olds do, they might hit or whatever, well, people are not for hurting. People are not for hurting even when we're angry. So again, doing that, so we're raising a generation of people who don't have these negative perceptions of feelings, because they just are. So...